Norma Jean didn't find out that she had a sister until she was 12 years old. Her mother Gladys, Lee Monroe, was only 15 years old when she married 24-year-old Jasper Newton Baker. The couple had a son, Robert, in 1917, and a daughter, Bernice, two years later. Gladys was beautiful, amorous, temperamental, and mentally unstable. She increasingly left the children in the care of neighbors, and she went dancing or to the beach with friends. Her husband, meanwhile, worked all day as a reseller. The couple constantly quarreled, and one day, it almost led to tragedy. Little Robert fell out of a moving car and injured his leg. The parents were busy sorting out the relationship and did not notice how Robert opened the car door. As a result of this incident, the boy limped for the rest of his life. John blamed Gladys for everything. She didn't look after the child. Constant disagreements and violent quarrels led to Gladys filing for divorce in 1921. After the breakup, Jasper managed to prove his wife's immoral behavior took the children and returned to his hometown of Flatlick, Kentucky. He insisted that Gladys communicate with the children as little as possible, perhaps because he suspected that the ex-wife was not quite mentally healthy even then. She visited the children a year later and, without remorse, left the children in the permanent custody of their father. In 1924, Gladys married Martin Edward Mortensen, an employee of the Southern California Gas Company, a Norwegian by birth. Even before she became pregnant with Norma Jean, she and Mortensen broke up just four months after their wedding. Gladys was dating many men at that time, and it is difficult to determine which of them was the father of Norma Jean. The likely father of Norma Jean is Charles Stanley Gifford, who worked at the film studio with Gladys. Norma Jean was born on June 1, 1926 in Los Angeles, and was the third child of 24-year-old Gladys, who by that time was working as a film editor at RKO Pitt Studio. An interesting fact is that when filling out the metrics of her newborn daughter, Gladys reported that Norma Jean was her third child, but the only one alive. Therefore, for many years, the girl did not suspect that she had a half-brother and sister. However, she was not at all up to finding relatives. Her mother could barely make ends meet and increasingly ended up in psychiatric hospitals, so Norma Jean spent her entire childhood in foster families and orphanages. In 1933, an accident happened. Robert Baker died. As a boy, he was restless and hooligan. During the holiday, he decided to experiment and put a firecracker in a glass bottle. He lost his right eye from the explosion. At the age of 15, Robert died of kidney failure due to an extensive infection. A year after the death of her eldest son, in January 1934, Gladys was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. By that time, she had practically lost contact with Norma Jean. However, in 1938, Gladys unexpectedly decided to write a letter to her eldest daughter, Bernice. Bernice had already celebrated her 19th birthday and had managed to get married and was expecting a child. One winter day, a few months after my wedding, my dad took me aside when I arrived home, Bernice recalled. He said, I do not know if I should give you this or not. At first I thought I'd never show it to you. Your stepmother and I discussed it and decided that this letter belongs to you after all. The envelope he handed me was already open. It was a letter from Gladys, in which she apologized to her daughter and confessed that Bernice had a 12-year-old sister named Norma Jean. She also wrote an address where she could contact her younger sister. In conclusion, she added that she herself was being held in a psychiatric hospital and begged her daughter to get her out of there. Bernice burst into tears and couldn't sleep. She did not feel resentment. There was only a desire to find her real mother again. Bernice wrote back to her mother. That's how their correspondence began. The girl carefully kept all the letters she received from the psychiatric hospital. They were dear to her. When she and her husband moved to a new place of residence, Bernice carefully packed them in boxes and took them to a new home. Sometimes messages from Gladys exceeded the volume of 10 pages. The unfortunate woman described all the torments she had to go through in the hospital and even developed a detailed plan for her rescue, which included an appeal to Congress. Gladys was no longer waiting for answers from Bernice. She was just bombarding her daughter with new portions of her crazy ideas. Despite everything, 
Bernice continued to maintain an active correspondence with her mother, even realizing the hopelessness of the situation. Soon she decided to write to her half-sister, who had not yet suspected her existence. After writing the letter, Bernice attached her photo to it. Soon she received a detailed reply, written in a round, neat handwriting, and a photograph of 12-year-old Norma Jean. The girls found a common language very quickly, they were cute to each other. Each of them had the feeling that they had known each other for a very long time. Despite the long correspondence, the girls did not dare to meet for a long time. They were separated not only by distance, but also by fear. How will this meeting go? Will they be able to get to know each other in person? Will they feel the very connection that was formed between them in correspondence? But the desire to reunite with a loved one still overcame fears. They both lacked maternal love and both felt abandoned and unwanted. In 1944, 18-year-old Norma Jean decided to come to Detroit to meet her sister. She has already started a modeling career. They agreed with their sister that they would meet at the railway station. Upon arriving at the station, Bernice was very worried about whether she would be able to find her sister in the crowd. Of course, she recognized her. As Bernice later recalled, I couldn't have missed it. She stood out from all the other passengers who got off the train. For the first few seconds, the girls stood in place without saying a word, and then rushed into each other's arms. Bernice brought her younger sister to her house, apologizing in advance for the fact that it was very small. Oh, it's okay, Norma replied with a smile. I'm used to small spaces. I even slept in a drawer. In a drawer? Bernice asked in amazement. Norma Jean explained that when her mother returned home after another rehabilitation course at the hospital, there was no cot in their house. Then she took a drawer out of the closet, put a blanket in it, and put her daughter there. At the time of their first meeting, Bernice was 25 years old, she was married to Paris Miracle, she had a five-year-old daughter, Mona Ray. Bernice has worked as a teacher, an accountant, and a costume designer. Norma Jean gave her sister tips on choosing makeup, and her wedding dress became Bernice's festive outfit. Norma Jean, who loves children very much, was fascinated by her niece Mona, and the girl sincerely loved her. The niece recalled, I was only five when we met. I remember she smelled great and hugged me all the time when we came to meet her at the station in Detroit. The girl told her aunt, I want to be as beautiful as you are. In response, Norma painted her nails with her red nail polish. Bernice and Norma talked a lot about their mother. The older sister asked Norma Jean, what does she look like now? Is she still pretty? Yes, she is still quite beautiful, but he never smiles. I went with Aunt Anna to her clinic, although now I think it would be better if I didn't go there. I haven't seen her since I was 10 years old. I'm not going there anymore. She doesn't look like my mother at all. There was so much pain and disappointment in Norma's words that Bernice did not ask her sister further about that trip. After the first meeting, Norma Jean sent her sister a postcard. Dear Bernice, I can't even describe in words how glad I was to meet you. Thank you for everything. I had a great time. Love, Norma Jean. A few months after her sister's arrival, Bernice and her family moved again, this time to Tennessee. All this time, the sisters kept in touch by correspondence. Norma was a little upset that her sister still lived very far away from her. She wanted them to become neighbors and be able to see each other more often. Bernice came to visit her sister in 1946. In the same year, Gladys was discharged from a psychiatric hospital. Bernice took care of her mother and helped her return to a normal life. 20-year-old Norma Jean who had already started her career as an actress. She went to acting classes and took the pseudonym Marilyn Monroe. As much as she missed her mother, this fact speaks for itself. Monroe is Gladys's maiden name, came to meet her mother. The girl decided to share with Gladys her dreams of becoming an actress in the hope that her mother would support her. Watching Norma perform speech exercises in front of the mirror, the mother said angrily, this is so ridiculous. You look stupid. You should do something useful. If you have nothing better to do, you can go and help me wash my things. But, Mom, I need to work on my pronunciation. And I need to wash these dirty blouses because I don't have money to pay the dry cleaners. There was silence. Bernice felt that her mother was being unfair to her younger sister and decided to intervene. 
I said I don't care what she does there. Her mother waved her off. From that moment on, Norma Jean gave up trying to get closer to her mother, but visited her regularly, took care of her, and always paid for her treatment. Monroe's sister was considered a truly close person. Despite the actress' busy work schedule and Bernice's move to Gainesville, Florida, the sisters occasionally visited each other. When there was no opportunity to see each other, they wrote letters. The sisters exchanged impressions, shared news, and congratulated each other on the holidays. A postcard that Bernice sent to Norma on her 33rd birthday in 1959 has been preserved. It is decorated with images of butterflies and is signed, with love from Bernice and Paris. A letter was also enclosed in the envelope. Dear Marilyn, I would like to fly over and visit you this summer during my vacation. Please call or text me when you will be at home and at what time you can come. Give my regards to Arthur. Love, Bernice. After Marilyn underwent gallbladder surgery in 1961, Bernice immediately flew to New York. She gave up all her business to be with her sister while she was recovering. The sisters supported each other in the most difficult moments of their lives, although they rarely saw each other. Unfortunately, this meeting of the sisters was the last. The sisters maintained a relationship until Monroe's death in 1962. Their last phone conversation took place shortly before the death of the actress. Monroe bought a new house and told her sister about it, consulted in terms of choosing accessories for the living room. Bernice, according to Monroe's will, inherited $10,000, a considerable sum at that time. Together with Joe DiMaggio, Bernice chose a dress for her sister's funeral. Bernice co-authored with her daughter Mona a book about her famous sister, My Sister Marilyn, Memoirs of Marilyn Monroe, which was released on Marilyn's birthday on June 1, 1994. These memoirs were not written at all in order to gain fame, but only to honor the memory of a much-loved sister. Bernice never tried to become famous due to her relationship with Marilyn.